whole thing seemed to be a kind of atmosphere of conflict inside the club. It was the players against John. There was some weird stuff going on behind the scenes in terms of how the players were being treated and things they were being asked to do, which you can maybe talk about. But it didn't seem like a healthy environment. It seemed that it was designed for conflict. There was It was inevitable that there was going to be a, a split. No, it was a, I think it was a difficult time. And, and the fact that there's facts there, Jacko, like that I had left to go to the club and, and everybody thinks me and Scotty uh, brush each other's teeth. Do you know what I mean? We, 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 we didn't. Do you know what I mean? We, we, he's got a big a big opinion. He's got a big character. He's got his own life. And I, we were joined at the hip and we were best of buddies. But, and, he, and he knows that even to this day, um, I would do anything for him and vice versa. It doesn't mean that we, we live in each other's pockets. Um, mm-hmm. And when, when the players done the revolt, and all met Rod Petrie. I'd already, I'd left the club for two or three yeah. months before that happened. So, so like a lot of people just want to drive an agenda that it was only me and John Collins that had an issue. It was John had an issue with a lot of the players. The, well, that's what we're saying. This thing, this thing seemed to be simmering, Tom. It did, and I, I just think you, you no, no, the biggest thing I would say, and I might be totally wrong, Jacko. I just I, I look back and think that he inherited a brilliant group that were all kind of fizzling up to like to like a a kind of climax where like. People yeah. were starting to get moved. O'Connor was obviously the first to move to Russia, then Riordan. Prior to that, Ian Murray had moved on. Gary Caldwell had moved on. And then the next batch were, were starting to attract interest. Marcel, Witties, Scotty's obviously. Fletcher was obviously just slightly after that, etc. So I think when John inherited the club as his first job, and I'm not sticking up for John, I might be totally off, off what he thought in the, the situation, but when you start to potentially lose some of your players, and I'd like to think we were good players, I mean, they're moving on to different clubs and pastures new. There's a natural instinct to to, to want to fight against that. Mm-hmm. I'm not so sure, in my opinion, he fought against it in the best way. Um, I think the like the man management part is is key. And, and listen, I've been a manager myself, so the harsh reality is you need to manage people that you m- maybe didn't particularly like. John maybe never particularly liked some of us. Maybe I was one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to think maybe Michael Stewart was maybe another that he never potentially gravitated to, but. Um, Nobody gravitates to Michael Stewart. Uh, listen, I, I, I like I like Michael. He's a great, he's a great thing, Dong. But listen, Michael's a top player as well, and I think that's like so. Michael would have the same testosterone that we all have. That we we feel as though yeah. we, we want to play and we we, we want to be. Um, we have that ego part in us that we think we're the best player. So Michael would have believed that he was the best player in that current crop. So when he then started to maybe no play as much or, or get less opportunities, he said, the natural thing would be to fight back for that or have an opinion on why you're not playing and, and probably no agree with what the manager's saying. I would say that some of the scenarios that popped up for, for me personally was I felt like it was, it was almost a fight every time we went to have a chat. Mm-hmm. It was never a... The dialogue and the communication between the two of us was was just never great, and it never ever I never ever left his office thinking. Apart from the very first day that he took me and Scotty in and said, "Listen, you are the best players. He's a this or that." He, he blew blew smoke right up our backsides, both of us, and we both left the office thinking that we were ten foot tall. He wanted mm-hmm. us in front of the he wanted us in first every morning. He wanted us at front of the the warm ups. He wanted us driving the training standards. He, he and he, he, he treated us for probably two or three weeks where I thought, well, that's. I'm not saying normal, but it's probably how we had been treated anyway through through yeah. Morgan, through Bobby, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then when that changed, I suppose, and I know the easy argument to that is that could change because of my attitude or or something I'd done or whatever I'd done. I'd like to disagree with that, but he might see different. I just think the communication between us players and 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 the staff at that given time was was I don't know if toxic's the right word, but it was difficult. And and when you have difficult situations as players, when you're all wanting to fight for your livelihood and fight for the club that you're representing. And it's, it's amazing how small things can get t- taken so out of proportion and then it can be so fractious within the camp that it can be so detrimental to the results. And, and without sounding disrespectful to the group, but the, the, the team never went that way, really. No. You know what I mean? The, 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 the harsh reality is, is that when good players were starting to move on, which is hard to, hard to replace, the, the, place, the players that John brought in were... Were, were, were like the kind of French boys, etc., and some of the boys that he wanted to bring in that he believed that were better than some of the ones that were moving on anyway. He was well documented in saying that that he was he was bringing in better players anyway. If they didn't work out, it, it doesn't look particularly good. The thing that I never understood, Tom, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about, is that some of the things that were going on inside the club, you know, not on the training pitch, in you know John's office or whatever, it seemed designed to to be quite demeaning. It was almost as if I'm the boss here. You, you know, there was there was certain 
there's a not something where, where we would get the guys to to strip down and go on scales and all that, and it was all about. It just seemed unnecessary, sort of a, a way to put people down a little bit. I, I, that's the bit that I that I just struggle to understand why you would do that in order to try and if if the aim is to to put a happy team in the pitch and a winning team in the pitch, none of that was conducive. No, that, no the bit that I would say about that, Jack, was that I suppose now you've matured, you look back and you think of these scenarios and. I think if John had a better relationship and better people skills and better communication skills with the players, these scenarios probably wouldn't have disgruntled the players as much. But when you're starting to have a bit of fraction and a bit, uh, sorry, fracas and a, and a couple of disagreements as a group mm. towards the staff, i.e. like the way we went through training with Tony Mowbray and, and how fit we were and how sharp we were compared to what we then used to do in training with with with, um, with John was, was, was night and day, really. Um, and by the way, wonderful player, like left-footed Scottish midfielder, like through the borders. He was somebody that I really, really looked up yeah. to when I was a young player. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and by the way, I, I'm not taking nothing of that away from him because he was a wonderful football player. Um, but when it comes to people skills and it being about us as football players now, he's a manager now. It's not about you as your your playing career or what you achieved or I'm bigger and better than them or I earned more money than them or I played at a higher level. It's about... You, you are the Hibs manager now, so even if you might think that we are not as good as what you are um, or, or stuff that maybe works for you, doesn't it always work for, for everybody else? And and I suppose the relationship with the players and the communication, I would flip that and say that it wasn't probably as good as it potentially could have been. So these wee things of going in and standing in the morning every morning was was becoming quite resentful for the players having to go along and drop drop take your T-shirt off and drop your kegs doing your slips, obviously, and stand on the scales and tell them your weight. It was it was one of these scenarios that rather than having the weight, uh, the weight bit, like a lot of teams will have maybe in the physio department or a sports science department, and you kind of go in and it's you kind of maybe look forward to maybe seeing the people in the morning. These wee scenarios didn't seem to be that big a problem, but I would say, and I, listen, it wasn't that big a problem getting weighed and standing with, with my kegs on and telling them my weight. It didn't bore me one bit, but it, when you started to obviously have and and a no particularly good relationship with somebody. That's what you ah, you do. You you kind of. It was people were waiting at the very last second to go along. Can you maybe had to get your weight done before half nine or whatever it may be? I'm just plucking that number at the sky. I didn't. I can't quite remember what time we had to be along to get it done. But the boys were going along at like thirty seconds to go and queuing outside his office just to go in and get weighed. Whereas if that was, in my opinion, a better circumstantial um, part within your morning routine i.e. breakfast, players just come and go. It's really relaxed. Yeah. It's a real nice atmosphere. It's something that you enjoy doing, if you know what I mean. And it's part of your routine, whereas... Sounds a bit of history. Aye, that part of the routine was something that nobody enjoyed, really. And it, it was because it wasn't just getting weighed and saying 76.7 or whatever. It was, especially to me, and I'm only going to speak for myself, is that he would say, oh, you need to be a wee bit stronger there, or you need a wee bit there, or you need a wee bit there, looking at your torso. And I'm standing there as a kind of 21-year-old, 22-year-old, thinking, I'd run through walls, man. I'm I didn't need muscles anywhere that I didn't need, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that I didn't want to get better. I didn't want to eat better or sleep better or try and become a better player, 100%. But when you didn't have a great relationship with somebody and he's he's telling you that you might need to be a bit better abs on your right-hand side or whatever, you're like... Was this every day, Kevin, or every week, or what? Every day, oh, David, I mean. Every day? Every day, yeah. It's a story. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely astonishing. So, so before you even kicked the ball of training, you're getting body shamed by the manager. Well, <laughs> so you're kind of saying that you need to like, listen. It's the same as a sports science, you know. Let's bulk you up. Let's get you stronger. I, I get that, but obviously, in that current, in that period, and in, in that specific situation, they probably never had a good, good relationship enough with the boys and his man to manager skills to, to be saying these type of things. It's just a harsh... He might be saying the right things. And by the way, ripped to bones he was. He was a br brilliant in the gym. As I say, an unbelievable player. But when it comes to the wee bits of managing that group and then getting the best out of individuals, I, I, I think he failed massively.